Microphone, anyways. Uh, wonderful. So I was talking to my uh, my friend Matthew Flat earlier about you know I, at having a conversation about how to replace the LaTeX typesetting system, and I said, "Geez, I wonder if the LaTeX people you know who've been sitting on this since 1976 have made any progress toward rewriting their own system." And, and to my surprise, there is something called the LaTeX 3 project, which is going to be the successor to LaTeX. And I thought, "Oh, good, they're they're working on it. Probably any minute now, they're going to release it." No, in fact, LaTeX 3 has been under discussion since 1995. They've just been sort of emailing each other. So. We're expecting that around 2035, they're going to have the uh, implementation spec ready, and then they can start doing things. We're good? Yeah. Okay. Yes, is it happening? What's that? Everything's, everything's good. How are things in Westlake? Boring. <laughs> well, move to Hollywood.
just put that in your pocket. Well, that's what the 3D glasses are for. Is this working? No. Ah, now? Yeah, all right. Perfect. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 7th RacketCon. All right. So we have a very exciting program both today and tomorrow with talks today and Racketeer office hours tomorrow. So we have a pretty packed schedule. Oh. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Testing is a wonderful thing. Uh, I don't think we have any talks about testing today, but testing is definitely something that we racketeers care a lot about, and ha hence what happened there. Anyway, so yes, we have a really packed schedule, but before we, we begin, I just want to have a quick, uh, you know, couple thank yous and a couple of logistical matters. So uh, the talks will all be in this room. Lunch will be downstairs where registration and breakfast were. Bathrooms are uh, that away. Uh, the signs uh, should tell you where they are. Uh, so that should be it for logistics. Uh, now, uh, for the thank yous, so of course, RacketCon would not be possible without the help of a lot of people, our speakers, our attendees, but also, of course, our sponsors. And so I would like to thank Black Swan Learning, I would like to thank Comcast, David Vanderson, Matthew Butterick, and the Pulse Group at the University of Washington, who's helped us a lot with the logistics. So please, let's have a big round of applause for our sponsors. <laughs> Good, so now, without further ado, let's move on uh, to our keynote. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce Dan Friedman and Will Bird. So Dan, Dan and Will, Dan and Will are poets whose medium is programs. And like all true poets, they seek to dive to the essence of things, to eliminate anything that is accidental, and distill everything to what is truly essential. And the end result is something that is both insightful and beautiful. So in the program today, we'll have insight and beauty. So thank you very much, and let's welcome Dan and Will. Uh, press Send a projector. Yeah, there we go. We have two slides in this talk. So it's twice as good as the last talk on Mini Canada. Really. Uh, yes, so this is poetry, um, but it's troll poetry, if you will. So the way it works is that Mini Canron is a language that exposes your inadequacy of understanding, in that you take some program that you think you understood and you implement it in Mini Canron, and then you quickly understand that you don't understand it as well as you thought you did. So we'll maybe show a little bit of that during the talk, and 
So, so one takeaway is you can take all of your racket code that you think you understand, all, by all I mean written in a tiny, tiny subset of racket, <laughs> also known as Dan scheme. In fact, there is a hash lang Dan scheme now. Uh, so everything we, we work on in this talk is going to be in hash lang Dan scheme. So when we accidentally say scheme, understand we mean hash lang Dan scheme, okay? <laughs> and if you see Shea scheme, remember this is hash lang Shea scheme. <laughs> well, I'd like to point out first to you that we're going to have three different approaches to writing programs in Mini Canron. Now maybe you haven't heard of Mini Canron and that's perfectly okay. Uh, so we're going to give you a, a very quick and uh, hopefully clear description of just how general the language is. Um, so it's probably best to think in terms of three different paradigms that we're going to use to characterize these three different ways of writing um, programs in mini Canon. So the first one is, well, just roll out your favorite functional program and in bracket, if you will, it's fine. I'm perfectly happy. I love bracket. And um, make sure it's functional is very, very important because, you know, functions are a special case of relations. And we are going to be talking about relations. So you have to start with functional. Now, um, so we're going to demonstrate very quickly for you um, how to do that. And then we're going to write um, uh, or show you an interpreter that we will then um, characterize as a, a mini Canron program for a Dan scheme interpreter or something close to that. And then finally, we're going to just blow your heads right off. Well, off you forgot the middle step. What's that? The middle step. Which is? Directly under the rules. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's so obvious. No, this is one of the main points of the talk. There, we have two slides. This is the other slide. Well, I don't like to right in the slides. middle. Is take remember the one in the middle. This is important. Yeah, it really, it really is because uh, some years ago, um, when Will was a student of mine, I had to explain to him why I was no longer going to be using Scheme as a programming language. I was going to be using something that in those days. Um, I called Canron, and that name came from Oleg. He uh, got excited about it, and we did some stuff together. And um, so I wanted to explain to, to Will that uh, there's a ton of stuff out there, just tons and tons of great rules, whether it's typing rules or what have you, and we can just lift it and play with it just all by ourselves. So when we get to uh, STL, uh, STLLC, we'll be able to see just how free all this stuff is and how we can just, just copy it and paste it, basically. STLC is the simply typed lambda calculus, by the way. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Don't let it intimidate you. You will know what that is in a few minutes. OK. So let's start with understanding everything that you need to know to write programs in mini -Canron. Do you have a prompt for yourself yet? Hold on. <clears throat> forget this. All right. Forget, the, forget what the, this buffer says. OK, so, <laughs> so let's start really. Well, first of all, how many operators are there? Oh, there's four operators we have to learn. One of them I don't actually call an operator because it's just a little interface tool to get you off the ground. So it's really three operators. And again, it's not really three operators. There's really only two operators. Because the other one is just uh, something that the world has known about since like 1966 and even before that with her, her brand and so on. So it's a very, very common thing called unification, right? So, by the way, it's a long name. You know what long names mean? Easy ideas. <laughs> OK, so here we go. You're getting a little feedback, Dan. And a very small uh, 
<laughs> breakfast so far, so I don't know what that means. Okay, so here we go. Let's, uh, let's just see what, this is the unification operator, equal, equal. Uh, let's just try five and five. What do you think? Well, nine and one, 55. Okay, so that's a third of the language right, right. there. <laughs> it's the equal, equal operator that uh, is the third. <laughs> Not the fives, we, we, we assume that. Okay, so um, let's see what it does. I'm excited. Well, what does it mean, Dan? Oh, it just says if two things are there the same in some sense of the word, the same, and then uh, we will succeed. Think E-Q-U-A-L and racket, question mark. Equal huh, I think you call it, right? <laughs> so this is like equal huh, and if we return it, we should get what? I hit return it. I should get hash T, hash, hash T, true, right? Oh. And I get procedure. So mm -hmm. what do you think run is all about? Run is going to make that disappear. So that's the one that's the interface operator. Okay, so just make sure you don't waste, it, you know, try to remember to do that. So now we're saying we want one answer, and whatever that answer is, we will get, be able to ferret out that answer if we know the variable Q. So, oh, but there's no Qs up there, so we got no answer. Well, we actually got an answer, it succeeded. And you can't beat success, right? So that says, we are going to have, just ignore the outer prends at the beginning here. And now there's another outer prend, you can just ignore that one too. <laughs> so the answer is underscore dot zero. And that's the association that we get from Q. So Q is the query variable. So it's the value associated with Q that we care about. And in this case, Q is just not involved in the computation. The only thing we really care about is does this call to equal equal end up succeeding or does it end up failing? We don't talk about truth and false or true and false. We talk about success and failure. In this case, it succeeds. Five is equal to five. So therefore, this query succeeds. Q is not involved in the computation. Therefore, Q remains unassociated, un uncommitted, if you will, right? And so our representation of an uncommitted variable is underscore dot some number. We'll so uh, let's try five and six. I want to see if those are equal. Okay, so are five and six the same according to equal huh semantics? No. no. So what should we get back, do you think? Empty list, okay, because we're getting back. We got no answers. A list of answers, okay? You can think of this as a set of answers, really. But we're getting back a list of answers. In this case, there's no value of, for Q that would make five equal to six. That's the way you can think about it. Is there any value for Q that makes five equal to five? Yes, any value of Q makes five equal to five. It's not involved. Is there any value of Q that makes five equal to six? No, for no value of Q is five equal to six. All right, so let's get Q involved. How about that one? Now what do you think we'll get back? Six in the pair of parentheses. Now the first, the inner pair, corresponds to the number of answers. So if we had a particular program that returned more than one answer, um, it would be less obnoxious to look at. But the other set of trends, we'll see them later again, as I said. So let's not worry about them yet. Okay, well, okay. All right. we've got so a complicated thing. So we've seen thing. half the language now, actually. 50% yeah. done, here we go. All right. Now let's see. What happens if we want to have um, an extra variable in here for some reason, like x? Okay. Inside? Yeah, do it fresh. So this is the third operator. Now this looks something like a lambda, right? And that's exactly what you want to think. It's, so it takes any number of arguments. You don't get the dot operator or anything like that in, in the formal parameters, but you do get any list of symbols. And even though we could make it work for putting in the same symbol twice, uh, we prefer to see an error message, so we don't do that. Some kind of error message. And now we have, what's going, what, who knows the answer? Anyone? Six. Underscore dot zero. Why is it underscore dot zero instead of six? 
Because Q is not involved in the computation. Not at all. Uh, right? And we believe in lexical scope, because lexical scope is magic, according to Dan. <laughs> so therefore, you know, that X is okay. just its own thing. It's locally scoped and all that. Q is not associated. Of course, we could change the X to Q. Then it gets then six. six. Or here is the fun part, is that once we're in fresh, we could use another call to equal equal. So how could we get back six in this case? Q and X. Okay. All right. Okay. And the important thing here is that once we're in this world, we can start playing games like reordering the code. Okay. And this has the same semantics. Okay. So now you have only one other operator to go. You know, we've been mentioning that when it's a whole list of values, that you, it's, it's less obnoxious to look at this. But um, now we're going to show you that operator. You all remember the operator cond from bracket or lisp or what have you. So we're going to use cond, right? So let's just write a cond here. And now we have as many cases as we want. The E stands for every, every answer, if you want. So Q could be 5, Q could be 6. And let's see what happens. And Any ideas? 5 and 6. 5 and 6. What? Run 1. Run 1. This is where that 1 comes in. We asked for the 1 answer. Now, could we have gotten 6 back instead? We'll try six. Sure. We could have gotten six back instead of five. That's implementation specific. We will get back some answer. It's, you know, yeah, we could, fact, we it, could flip a coin if we wanted to. This particular implementation doesn't, but you should imagine that the, the order of the answers we get back doesn't matter. I can ask for a second answer, and now I get five and six. And I can ask for all the answers with a star, and we get five and six and no more. So that's a proof that there are no more answers. Because mini Canron is a theorem prover. Okay. All right. So the language is done. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> That's and it. run doesn't really count. It really Runs doesn't count. Run's the interface between mini Canron and racket. Notice there's a star up there. That's all the answers. So remember that for the future. Okay. So we are now ready to write our first program in mini Canron. But in order to do that, we have to start, well, in this particular facet of the lecture, you have to start with an honest to God functional program in a very small subset of, of whatever. <laughs> Go ahead. It's called Racket. Racket, yes. Well, I was thinking, <laughs> should I say Dan's game? It sounds really weird, weird to me. OK, here we go. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So what, we're going to define a pen or something? Uh, yes, that's always the best one to start with. Yeah. I'm going to call it my append for reasons uh, that I'm not going to explain right now. Yeah, not to, <laughs> and not even to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are these things called namespaces and modules and stuff. Yeah, right. We oh, don't believe right. in that. So no, right. <laughs> it Never. may be that the implementation uses something called a pen. Yeah, maybe. But if you were in full racket and you did it right, then you wouldn't have no, some you wouldn't problems have that, yeah, no. that Dan doesn't worry about. OK. But now I do, because of other things. <laughs> so it's just as bad. All right, moving on. So here's a nice little function, lambda ls. And um, most of us know that the first line is a null. All right. What are, uh, okay. OK, what do I write next? Um, ah, they know. Come on. What do you write next? S. S, that's S. right. Now what? <laughs> That's good. Well done. Now, now let's you, get did it. Did you take the how to design programs course? <laughs> <laughs> Only two mistakes in that. Not bad. <laughs> so first we have to write the natural, re the natural recursion, which oh, is. Oh, all right. We're past that. Well, part. fine. Okay, and what's the natural recursion? Coderel, right? Coderel. It's natural. And now we can extend the natural to adding what, why it's not correct. So it's now the car of L. And now we are done, and it works like a champ. 
Oh, my pen. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. And you know what? It might have worked. And that's even I, I worse, I right? That's, take, that's yeah, a good really bad situation. <laughs> I need to take that course, too. All right. So now we have my pen. Right, here we go. And I, it's nice to have something like the easy case right off the bat, right? Here we go. Yeah. And so we, we won. We got step one is done. Now our next step is to translate with almost no thought how to write. <laughs> Will always thinks that I'm crazy. Sorry, right. it's, it's fine. <coughs> Most All people right. do. <laughs> All right, so we're going to turn this program into a mini Camden program. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, change the name to My Appendo. My Appendo? OK. Unless you want to go to just Appendo. That works for okay, me. I don't care. That's fine. The rule is there is no rule. It no, there to, are rules. No, nah, it's not a rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's a decision we made to make it easy to distinguish whether something is a function or a relation. That's it. And all right, the little O kind of looks like a top, of a, it looks top like a of a question mark. mark. I don't know, whatever. OK, so, um, so we're done with the phase one as soon as we add an extra argument to the, the reason. Well, that's add, a different step. Come on. I know it is, but OK, so um, all right, so we go through. Uh, no. Yeah. No. Fine. Out. Fine. You really shouldn't call it out. I know we shouldn't call it out. <laughs> I do. I really do. But you have to have some reasonable sounding name, it's pronounceable, and has the O in it, and all the good things. OK, so what we're going to do now is just walk through this very easily. So the first one, oh, we have to change the con to con D. Right, that would be wrong. Now, the second thing we do is we change the null to no, no. nullo. Very good. And then we want to assume. I don't have nullo defined, though. You, you have what? No. We don't, I don't use nullo. That's oh, not the equal, way to equal, do it. Uh, equal, equal. We only have equal, equal, okay. condi, and fresh. That's Fine. it. Equal, so what equal, would be the equivalent quote, nil. of null? Equal, equal, quote, empty list. So we have to use equal, our friend equal, yes. equal. Okay. And this does two jobs. So if L comes in as the empty list, this will succeed. If it's not the empty list of something else, like a pair, it will fail. But the other thing is if L comes in and doesn't have a value yet, it will become the empty list. That's the magic. Sort of like a two-way pattern matching, if you want. In to other know. words, it's just been freshed at some point, and it's still fresh. OK. So now what we have to do is we have to associate the answer to the variable out. So let's just do that with equal equal. Oh, just giving it away. OK, fine. I got to make it work at it. Oh, well, you <laughs> tell me. Never mind. OK. All right. So, so we don't return values. Instead, we have this out argument, and we associate the out argument with a value instead of returning it. So did anybody want to guess why Will doesn't like the out argument name? What's that? Louder? Because it can go in. Yeah, exactly. Because it's relational. It can go every way. <laughs> yeah, basically. It can do more than go in or go out. It can, we'll see. Yeah. So here we go. So um, now what we have to do is, well, just forget about else. And now what we have to do is break up these expressions into what we call nested expressions. It's kind of like CPS. So if you know about CPS, it should go smoothly enough. So the first thing we have to do is get ourselves a value for the cutter of L. That's what you'd sort of do if, if, if cutter L were F and you were CPSing. You want and, the cutter of L? Yeah. All right, so we'll do a... Oh, it kind of makes use cutter O because... Because we're not going to use that. But, but we could do it the other way if you yeah. want. If you want to just use equal equal, we can do that. Let's yes, just do you. that. So um, the list is L, right? And we want to make that into a pair. 
We know, okay, and now we have A and D, and we are all set. We've now torn it, torn it apart. Yeah, so the car of L it would be like this A thing, and the critter of L would be like this D thing. So we can use cons and equal equal together to do like a form of pattern matching. Um, you want so to we show build this pair up of two fresh variables, A and D. We unify that pair with L, and that has the effect of tearing L apart and matching its car and cutter to A and D. Okay. okay. You don't want to use quasi quote here. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I thought I'd ask. Okay. <laughs> so now we've taken care of the, the cutter part. Right so I can here. I can replace if I want to do it this way. That's kind of That's where right. we are. Yeah. Okay. okay. So now we have to worry about the, the Kanze part. And so once again, we have to. Well, not the Kanze part. Well, we're doing CPS. Yeah. Inside out. Well, that's. That's the append. Okay. That's okay. recursion. All right. Yeah. All right. So we have my appendo. We basically are going to have a call to my appendo, mm -hmm. except my appendo, unlike append, takes three arguments instead of two. Sorry, so we buddy. still have D and S. We're going to need a different out variable. Yeah. And for that, we use the word res as in result. <laughs> well, you, yeah, we're good. But as in result or thing in Latin. It's that thing that gets the cutter of the recursion. And now we have uh, one more thing to do. So it's like if we had res here. Mm -hmm. Sure. They're going to ask to make it bigger. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. Whoever said that. And All now right. we want to do the equivalent of returning cons a res. So how do we return something? Unify with out. That's right. So out is going to get cons a res. So this looks a little strange, perhaps, especially if you haven't seen continuation passing style or things like that. But after you've done a couple of these, it becomes fairly natural. We're also going to show you some other ways to, to do this, by the way. OK, so there's our definition. Yes. OK, Okay. so now it's time to see if it works. We got a pen to work. Let's hope that we can get something else to work. So we're going to use the exact same test program just to make sure it's not broken. And sure enough, we get one answer, and it's the right answer with a bunch of prints. OK, so let's see. Is there other things we might do? OK, well, um, what's that? Is that all the answers? How can we tell? Run star. Run star. Looks like it. That's a, that's a proof. It's a true proof. OK. That's a good, good example. What else? Well, um, could we put in a variable, say, where quote DE is? OK. There's one. And let's um, put in the ABCDE here. So I'll take the old answer and put it there. So what should we get back? Ah, OK. Look at that. Perfect. Now, is that the only answer? <coughs> Apparently yes, so. OK. Now, right. let's try. Um, let's see. How about um, moving that queue to the first position? OK. And that works. Uh oh. Oh. Uh oh. What, what happened? What happened? What happened? Recursion got us. Uh, hmm. Well, remember how I said you can swap these goals around any way you want? These things are called goals. Well, it is true you can do that. Sometimes you'll get an infinite loop if you do that. <laughs> uh, that's OK. It means you, there's no more You would more not answers. have believed when we were working on the, re the Reason Schemer the number of times we had an infinite loop. So an infinite loop is Mini Canron telling you that the answer doesn't exist. 
if no answer exists and the search tree, the search space is infinite, Mini Canron will never stop looking for it. So Mini Canron's working on your behalf forever and you have no gratitude. <laughs> if, oh, you just have confidence. If there is an answer, Mini Canron will find it, theoretically, assuming you have infinite memory <laughs> and infinite time. Uh, but if we reorder. Notice the recursion is last. Now it comes back. It comes okay? back. So you have to be careful with this. And in general, if you have two recursions, like in an interpreter or something like that, or Fibonacci, then you can't play this game so easily because you can't have both of them come last. Then you have to be more clever, and that's something we've been working on for 12 or 13 years, is trying to be more clever about that. Uh, when you are more clever, you can get some pretty good speed ups. Like we'll show you something at the end where uh, Greg Rosenblatt sped it up something like eight orders of magnitude for some of our queries. So, you know, when you're in an exponential space, uh, okay, you know, now those are sort we of could take some time and drop in some variables in sort of random spots. All right, how about I, I do? I think we're running a little yeah, shy on time. Yeah, let's do times. this. Let's just do one more thing. All right, one more. All right, so what's the answer here? Yeah, so it's these are all of the possibilities, right? So these are the sorts of things. You can get multiple answers back. And what if I were to write this query? <laughs> Mini Cameron would work for you yes. for a very long time. But if you change that star just a teensy weensy bit, <laughs> well, that's not terribly interesting. No, but it notice, is interesting. It but is it, is, it has some nice math properties, right? Yeah. It says, if you give me the empty list as the first argument and anything else, not even a list, anything else, I will give you back the same thing you gave me. Because if you look at the definition of a pen, you will see, go show me the, oh, there you are. Okay. You, you don't need, that's the real a pen, not the Maya pen, right? But it's the same thing. Okay, so okay. we need to move on, otherwise we yes, will yes, yes. not come So what, what, where, what do you want to go do? Do we just jump to the interpreter? <laughs> I think we need to jump to the Okay, uh, no. forget, forget our plan. Remember well, those three points, well, we're going to jump the to the STLC, let me just say one thing. Oh no, thing actually we did the first one, this is the first okay. one. Okay, so let me just say one thing about uh, STLC. We, we, we had the plan, but in, <laughs> it's three, well show the rules at least. Fine. Yeah, so these are the three rules. <laughs> Okay, this is, that's it. Three rules. Can't beat that. And even bigger, uh, I don't know why. Um, you can read it off. You can quite literally read off and type in the rules just like they are, except for the first one because you have to kind of know that you've got to be looking something up in a type environment, which is what gamma is. But other than that, you just read it off. So. Well, can you show the code real quick? Just like a, one of those things? Uh, well, I got some code here, I think. Okay, so that. Oh, whoops. No. Don't look at that one then. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's here somewhere. No, that's the wrong thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I downloaded the code. You sent me the Yes, code. I sent you the oh, code. Oh, yeah, hold on. Yeah, Dan sent me the code last night. Actually, this runs in Racket, I think. Uh, what is it called? Downloads. Here you go. So you were showing Racket after all. <laughs> there it is. So that's it. You see the condi, you see the three cases, and you see the lookup O. And you see the arrow. So. And arrows in all the right places. And stuff. In Racket, you can use gamma and stuff, but we don't know how to do that. It's like Unicode <laughs> well, or something. We don't use it too often, let's say. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so now we'll move on to the, the juicier part of uh, today's talk. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we said that's the, you, you can run rules. That's, that's it. Just, and so many rules are out there. It's wonderful. All right, so here we go. And then you can run those rules backwards, by the way. Ooh. And what do you get when you run a type checker backwards? A type inference or backwards? 
inhabitation, type inhabitation, which are programs that have that type. And so when you run a 100 or 200 or 300 to get answers, you get 300 answers, all of which are programs. So it's a program generating system when you have types. Okay? All right. Next, okay. we will talk about the. Okay, so now we're going to change levels, conceptual levels at this point. We wrote in scheme, that was when, before Racket. We wrote in scheme to implement Mini Canman. We then now will take and write a scheme interpreter in Mini Canman. Okay? Just like we wrote Appendo. Exactly Ryan. the same. And you'll know because we're going to call it a vowel. Oh, yes. So, oh, there it is. You're and you'll so see that it takes an out argument as a second argument, an expression and a value. So the okay. Q represents the value corresponding to the expression that's its first argument. So what's the value of lambda xx? Closure. Closure. It's closure. Woohoo! There it is. That's right. You guys see it this way. With the word procedure, right? OK. Yeah. OK. So now what do we do? It's you obvious. saw my appendo. What, right. do we do with, what do we do with the vowel? Run star. Run star. OK, that's, that's a good one. Proof. Proof. There's only one. All right, only good. One. OK, now what? The key words in this enterprise. Yeah, the answer is the closure. Let's take the closure. Put it in there. So first of all, we'll try that. We get back underscore zero. That means it's consistent. Okay. Right. That, it worked. That sure enough, that lambda value is that closure. Now let's put the Q here. So now what do you think we'll get? Two lunch <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No lunch until it comes back. <laughs> Thank you, Matias. All right. What, what? Run two. Run two. All right, All right, here we go. Ah, look at this. Ooh, so what is this answer? So the first one is lambda xx. What does the second thing mean? What is that? So you can see there's a side condition. That's why we have that extra set of parentheses. That's what it's for. We have a side condition saying underscore zero is some symbol representing an identifier. So this could be any identifier. It could even be x, actually. Um, so if I said this is y, for example, then basically it's saying that this expression should evaluate to the closure representing the identity function. Okay? All right, so that's what's going on there. So that's the idea of our Valo friend. Okay, mm -hmm. so now what can we do with it? That's more fun. Any, any thoughts? How about, right. uh, how about I love you? I love you, okay, sure. So if you, you may have seen this, but it's, it's so cool. <laughs> All right, you may have seen a couple of these things. That's okay. It's okay to see them again. Each time it becomes more obvious. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Matt might uh, wrote this blog post on 99 ways to say I love you in racket, right? So there are 99 racket expressions, right? That evaluate to the list I love you. And say, say uh, Will, by the way, do you have any of your own private versions of this? Of what? How many do you have? Why well, haven't I gotten there? Hold on. How, how, no, no, no. How many have you got stored away? We haven't shown it yet. Wait a second. Know, well, Wait a second. It comes later. OK. All right. <laughs> OK, so thank you, Dan. Uh, OK, so what are we going to do? How, how do we try to get 99 racket expressions or, or Dan million, scheme or expressions? Million. That evaluate to the list. I love you. Run 99. Run 99, sure. OK, and then I can just type in I love you, right? I love Hopefully. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and sure enough, we get 99. We get 99 <laughs> things that are all uh, going to evaluate to I, the list I love you. Yeah, supposedly. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. So. There are all these side conditions saying that 
these underscore zeros and underscore twos are identifiers and symbols representing identifiers and all that sort of thing. But uh, that's the sort of thing we get. Okay. Once we have that, then what, Dan? Well, you could probably do something like quines that uh, Stuart Holloway suggested. Okay. So what is a quine, Dan? It's an expression that it evaluates to itself. Ooh. Those are puzzles in general, right? People say, okay, can you do it in C? Can you do it in whatever? And every, you know, there's, a, there's a website out there with like, every language has its own quine, so to speak. And let's just see if our Avalo will give us, oh, look at that. Oh, what happened? Oh, you cheated. You <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, they can do the next one. All right. Anybody yeah. else? Okay, well, wait, wait, hold on. We yeah. gotta check that it's a client. Oh, yes. Let's verify. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Proof. <laughs> okay. All right, now what else you got? All right, you wanna do twine? No, I was. Uh, okay, sure. what do you wanna do? Twine is okay, but do it fast. <laughs> okay. Because we're now even fewer minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really cool to see the twine. You know what a twine is, right? It just, you take an expression and it evaluates to some other expression. And right. then you take that expression and it evaluates to the one you started with. That's called a twine. And every quine is trivially a twine, so we have to put a constraint on it saying that they're different. Is it called a disequality constraint? And we don't know if it, we don't know if it's correct, but we have to find. So notice out. this expression has a quote on it. This one does not. <laughs> now we get a quote back. This is called trolling, <laughs> <laughs> which is what Mini Cameron is amazing at doing. <laughs> it can absolutely tell you things you didn't really need to know. <laughs> it's like, you didn't like that twine? Make your own. Yeah. After you generate a few like tens of thousands, I think you start getting interesting ones. Something more interesting, yeah. OK, um, so now we're really ready to get to the juicy stuff. OK, so we, right. where, were, yeah. where were we? We had just written an, uh, an interpreter called Evalo, right? And now what we're going to do is we're going to write a oh. program called a pen using the interpreter called Evalo. And as who? The, it's the data to it. So we're going to need some way of calling this interpreter recursively. And um, so we're going to need something like a let rec or whichever your choice is, Will. Yeah. So who, uh, by the way, came up with this idea? This is Michael Ballantyne's idea. He was uh, working with Will at Utah, and Will is moving from Utah. And um, let's see what happens. Hold on. One second. We need like this hash lang thing, right? Yep. Or, yeah. Sorry. But all of this actually does work in Racket. I just don't know yeah. how to load the files as well. Right. Sorry. <laughs> S I'll Set learn allow someday. incomplete search, whatever that is. Yes. Yes. Okay. So as I said, this <laughs> Forget is. Forget you saw and, that. And what you're looking at, what you're what you're looking at now is really very live research. You know, the the book came out in 2006. 2005. 2005. And um, ah, yeah. That's a few years ago. This is now very active research. And actually, I think probably most of the researchers do it all in racket at this point. Yeah. OK. So let's do what Michael Ballantyne suggested. And let's actually define append. But like append as if you would write it in racket directly, OK? No need for nope. O's. Yeah, none of this other stuff. So we're just going to do, you know, this is not the relational version. This is just the functional version. And I'll do this. OK. 
Now, does that or does not look, that, that look just like a pen, yeah? Could almost picked it up from the file system. All right, and now you want to give it a call, right? Yep. Okay, so let me go inside the body and do our favorite example. Now, notice this one doesn't have an out inside of append itself, but a valo takes a second argument. So we can put the query variable there. And let's see if this runs Stare forward. at that for a minute or so. I mean, you really got to stare at that. It's just a pen. Yeah, it's just a pen. <laughs> and there's the answer. And now try it with some variables, Will. OK. So now the interesting thing, what Michael pointed out was what we should be able to do is the game we played with Appendo, where we take the list, we plop that in where the queue is. That's consistent. And now we can go in and put a queue here. Notice this whole expression is back quoted. So comma Q, that's our query variable. So what do you think we'll get when we run this? This, query? by the way, means that quasi quote is part of the language that's being interpreted. Yes, so we implemented actually, well, no, this is quasi quote and scheme. We deleted the quote, though. Oh, yes, we did. We did delete the quote. That turns out to be important. Yes. That turns out to be important. So what do you think we'll get back? We better get ABC. OK, we will not. That is not ABC. That is quote ABC. Oh, OK. What do you think if, will happen if we do a run two? <laughs> Welcome to the world of reflection. So, so what happens if we do a run star? Hilarity will ensue. Well, what if we put the quote back? Now there's only one answer again. So we've recaptured the behavior of Appendo, but we get additional behavior because we just removed the quote. And now, because we're in the relational interpreter for a subset of racket, and this is a subset of racket. It even has racket match, subset of racket match, things like that. Now we can start synthesizing expressions in Racket or mini Racket that evaluate to the list ABC. Okay, so we've gained expressive power. Okay, what else could we do? Where else could we put our query variable Q? In the implementation. In the implementation, like here in append, right? <laughs> Good thinking. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Let's try another. I'll run two. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually correct. Can I do run star? Uh, uh, run star would be bad idea. <laughs> They're infinitely many. Well, what about the, the third one? Can, okay. can, can you mess with the definition at all? All right, yeah, hold on. Oh, well, well this you is fun. I'm I like at, this. I'm looking at the <laughs> clock. So th this is mini cannon trolling, pretty, pretty. Ugly. <laughs> but I love this answer. I wouldn't have come up with that one. Yeah. If some undergraduate gave you that answer, you'd be like, F. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where else do you want to put it? How about where that S is? The S, all right, let's put an S. Uh, let's put it. Q, comma Q. Q. Replace the whole lambda. <laughs> well, that's coming up if it'll give us a chance. <laughs> all right, we got an S. Well, hold on. Let's see if there's a second answer. Ooh! <laughs> First chink in the armor. Mm. Hmm, so what do we do? Well, what if we did a list of two calls to append, and we had like empty list and empty list, and now we expect the output to be empty list and the other list. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Do append, uh, do append empty list, uh, it skipped the other first 
Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you could play this for a while, right? Yeah, so, if, I don't know. It, it works in mysterious ways, right? Uh, it's, yeah, like AlphaGo, you're not going to know what it's going to do next, probably. <laughs> okay, so uh, I heard, let's synthesize, let's remove the lambda. All right, let's do that. So wait, we, we, we want to remove what, the whole lambda ls thing? Yeah, just start with the symbol lambda. Yeah. <laughs> the start with the symbol, you well, mean that, like? One, one step lambda. at a time, one step at a time. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you want, no, wait, wait, wait. No, no. Oh, you want to put it here. Yeah. Yes. Q of yeah. L, oh, whoops. Oh, sorry. You want to do that. Yeah, I'm yeah. Saying like that? Yeah. All right, that's Oh, no, that's easy. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> what, are, what are their two answers? Let's see what the second one is. Oh, mm. proof. That's a run star. There they go. <laughs> wow. See, Minnie Cannon's uh, smarter than a fifth grader. <laughs> okay, where else do you want to put it? Is that enough? Is that proof? Where are you? Yeah. Change the name of end and the definition to Q. Okay. Do I put the slam to back? Yeah. Sure. Ooh. None the recursive faults, just there. Just there? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, figure that out. What if we do two? Proof. It's only one answer. You can't beat. You really can't beat this. This is. It's so cool. Well, you, um, but, well, you can we, beat it let's, fairly easily, let's, actually. But <laughs> let's. Um, if not, I, I okay. say, where's my Turing award? Why, why don't we uh, zip over to Barlowman? Okay. Oh, I got to show you. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll show you some some racket history here. So I'm not very good at racket programming. Uh, but I decided the day before I gave a talk at Pepham that that would be a good time, the night before actually, it'd be a good time to learn enough racket to implement a prototype of this. Uh, the Barlow and stuff. Of, of the front end in, in interface. So this is what I ended up um, creating. And it's on GitHub if you want to play with it. I don't recommend it, but it, you know, it's like, Babby's first racket program or something. So uh, what this is, is, let's see if I can, yeah. So this is like a crude interface to what you saw before. And you know, I, I was writing those different calls in a list. That's basically what's happening. Append empty list, empty list gives you empty list and so forth. So here's some examples, inputs, output. And you can see I've got an append up there and I've got a body. And the idea is that, I can replace the S here. I think I can do like a comma A or something. And you'll see that down here it figured out that the comma A is an S, okay? Um, but like I said, I'm not like a racket <coughs> GUI master or anything. So I kind of got stuck after that. And in fact, I don't even know how to quit it. Oh yeah, there we go, quit. Okay. So uh, I learned myself a tiny bit of um, called Swift, I think it's called, yeah. And I made like a slightly less bad version, very slightly less bad, called Barlman. And so this is um, you know, sort of the same thing. And I hope people, actually Michael Ballantyne and I sat down and we realized that actually we could do, or someone could do a much better version of this in Racket, that everything I'm doing actually could trivially be done in Racket, I think. Uh, so I hope people, We'll try to take that up, and maybe that's a good thing that we could do uh, for tomorrow for office hours. Um, sit down with some people who know Racket better than I do, and we could try to knock this out. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to try to do the things we were doing before, except uh, we have sort of a constrained interface where we have input and output examples on the right. You can see anywhere we have a comma uh, uppercase letter, that's a, a variable, a mini Kenron variable. It represents an unknown name of the function or whatever it is, arguments, body. Um, and there's a little extra special sauce. So Michael Ballantyne sped up the version of mini Kenron by uh, an order of magnitude using some, some clever tricks. And uh, Greg, um, Rosenblatt. Greg Rosenblatt came along and he used uh, some other clever tricks to speed up some of our queries about eight orders of magnitude. 
uh, which turns out helps quite a bit. And uh, so, so we're going to show you kind of a couple things that you can do once you've sped things up. So let's try this again. Uh, so append empty list, empty list. Should be the empty list. And now Barlman thinks and it says, OK, you want to find append. And it's going to be very attic. It takes any number of arguments and it returns the empty list. <laughs> well, let's give it another. Let's say append of you know, A to B. Here comes the troll. OK, it's going to think. <laughs> and we got a little further saying, hey, you probably want a function of two arguments. And we're going to check to see if the second is null. Well, if so, we return that one. Otherwise, we return a, b. And we can add more examples if we want to keep it from specializing. But we can also have sort of this idea of an eigenvariable or sort of a lexically scoped gensim. Um, so these comma g things, that's my crude interface for that. This is also something that could be improved. And so here we're saying we don't actually care uh, what the value of g1 and g2 are. We just want to make sure they don't appear in the code. So now it's not specializing as much. You can see it's taking the cons and cars. But it hasn't figured out the recursion. So let's do one more example. So let's do lists of length 2. Whoops. Whoops. Ah. Yeah. It's going to think about that. Hopefully, I gave it the right example where hilarity will ensue. OK, so it came back and it figured out the recursion. Now, it's a little hard to read that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give names to the arguments. And now you can see that it got the recursion. And this is the correct definition of a pen. So it was able to actually fill in all the details. And in fact, if I really want to, I can. Uh, replace that whole thing with a logic variable. Don't forget you're in charge. <laughs> Don't forget you're in charge when we have to quit. Yeah, you're in charge and it's able to figure that out. Oh, so so this is, you know, this is still only like a, a sort of a three-line program that we're able to synthesize. But um, you know, we've made a lot of progress in even getting to this point, and uh, it looks like there are a whole bunch of techniques that we haven't tried yet or haven't used yet that will help us radically speed this up much more. So you know, we got nine orders of magnitude over the last two years. And I'm hoping if we get another nine orders of magnitude, then it'll start becoming interesting. And then the next nine orders of magnitude, that will really count. And you know, at some point, it starts to add up. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, there's a lot more things we could show. But uh, if, you want, if you're interested in this, you might want to check out um, our website, which is uh, minicanron.org. Okay. And also, we'll be around tomorrow, I think, for the yeah, office hours absolutely. if people want to yeah. sit down and play around with this and you know, experiment. Okay. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Dan and Will. Uh, uh, we have time for a few questions as well if, uh, if people have questions. Uh, and given that it's a pretty big room, I think it's probably best if you just you know, speak as loud as you can and then have the speakers I, I, repeat the I, question. I think we'll be able to hear it, especially from the second row. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with the program synthesis, have you thought of anything like, like tactics and proof assistance? OK. That kind of goes the other direction. But mm. since you're going, you're going both directions, do you have like programmable tactics where you can help it figure out the program to synthesize? Uh, so, so the question is, for program synthesis, have we thought of using things like tactics um, to, to help? Yes, we've thought about this. And, and in fact, if you notice, uh, there's a whole lot of information that we're not exploiting at all. So you know, in all the examples, we're giving exactly two arguments to append. But it, the system doesn't know. It thinks it might be variadic. So it spends a lot of time trying to find variadic versions, for example, where a very simple rule might be, if all the examples take exactly the same number of arguments, maybe you want to guess that. Or you maybe parallelize it and have something like that. Uh, I think there are a lot of things we can do with tactics, lots of things we can do with heuristics. There's a lot we can do with parallelization, where Hey, why not run it on a machine with you know 
40 cores or something like that, and then you can be speculative and try guessing some heuristics and things like that. We're also looking into machine learning techniques and all sorts of other things. Another thing you could do is, you know, we're doing basically a subset of Racket without any types. And it's been very clearly shown, and we've also, uh, Michael Ballantyne has some, some preliminary results showing that if we did a typed version, like a parenthesized ML or something like that, then we can get a much, much better performance in pruning. So I think there's a whole bunch of things we can do, each of which will give us several orders of magnitude well, speed up. Why not type track it? Well, I want to do an implementation of Mini Canron in type racket because Dmitry Bujilov and his students at University of St. Petersburg in Russia have a language called Ocanron, which is an OCaml version of Mini Canron that uses a deep type embedding. And they've been able to show that they can get away a with not having to have some of the constraints or some of the annoying tagging inside of the interpreter, uh, inside the relational interpreter, and also it's a little safer in some ways. Uh, it's a little easier to interpret the results. And I, one of the things I would like to see people try is a typed racket version of Mini Canron that does a deep type embedding and really takes advantage of the, the type structure. Yes? As you were writing more and more tests, you started to write general tests. Right here, you're using the variables to basically say the elements don't matter. But if you continue doing that, you're basically going to write the equational theory, the relational theory, on the right-hand side of the test, which is actually what Appendo was in the first place. So do you see going further down this road, basically just re-implementing the relations inside of your test? Uh, OK, so, mm. so the question has to do with sort of, sort of how we specify the relations and you know, the fact that we have these sort of these eigenvariables. And, um, at some point, we end up sort of specifying append or a, a fair bit of append. One of the things that we, we really want to do is be able to have things like true universal quantification, be, the ability to specify uh, properties, contracts, um, you know, types optionally maybe, and have a whole bunch of different ways to specify our programs, not just examples. So, uh, what, what I'd like to do, one of the interesting things about this approach as opposed to some other approaches to synthesis, uh, obviously we're not the only people doing synthesis. Actually, many people at University of Washington are doing great synthesis work. One of the things I think is interesting is that what we have is essentially an a la carte um, approach where you can put variables anywhere you want. You can actually put variables within these examples, and that works fine. You put examples within, uh, variables within the code. If you had a type system, you could put variables within the types and so forth. So I'd like to get to a system where we can express program properties in many different ways, and, but you're not required to specify any of that information if you don't want. And in fact, you know, Barlaman takes advantage of that because Barlaman can act like an IDE. You can edit this code, and once you have all of your examples, Barlaman in the background will try to synthesize the missing code and will also try to prove if your partially uh, written code is incorrect or inconsistent with the examples you've given. So that, that sort of feature, I think, would be really neat to have. Sam? Can you, uh, relating to that, can you delete, now that you've written test three, can you delete some of the other tests and have it still succeed? Yeah, that's a very good question. Or the other thing that I, I didn't show you is I wrote these tests in a very specific order. What if I just reverse the order? It wouldn't work very well. Because what's going to happen is, this is essentially a conjunction. Remember how I showed you that the conjunction isn't truly commutative? What would happen is it would try synthesizing the biggest example first instead of the smallest example. So it wouldn't try to synthesize the base case effectively first. It wouldn't know what the base case is. So it would be much, much slower. One of the things that uh, Greg Rosenblatt's working on in particular, he's working on a new version of Mini Canron called DCanron that's much, much smarter about dynamically rescheduling the goals. This is one of the ways you know, we got this big improvement in speed is, is doing some by hand re reordering of goals. He's trying to do it in an automatic way. And that would have the effect of, first of all, allowing you to reorder the goals any way you want, these examples any way you want, and still get the same performance. Whether or not that would allow you to have a single large example, I'm not sure. That might, it might not help with that example. Uh, what tends to happen in practice is you want to have an it, example for the base. Sam case. wants to know if you just delete test two. In other if words, you just do, what? Just do test one and three. What, what would it do? Oh, we can try it. Yeah, it should be easy to do. 
Yeah. And, wh and while we're thinking about doing that, I really, really, really want you to see the higher order. Oh, it came back. Yeah. Is it right? <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't get the uh, recursion. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's, what it's doing is it's trying to find something that passes those two tests. So for whatever reason, that particular example passes those two tests, right? And this is the other problem is if you don't have things like universally quantified properties, if you synthesize something purely from the examples, you don't know that it's actually correct, right? So you need to some, have some other way of checking to make sure it's correct. Um, so in this case, those two examples, like many Kenrin's like, oh, I'll be lazy. That seems to pass those two tests, yeah. and you know, you what do you want me so, to do? So be before we go, I want you to show the first interpreter that's taught in C311, mm. written in, in the scheme interpreter for, it's been built by Mini Cameron. That is something that uh, I think is just absolutely one of the most beautiful things to look at. So this is in the ICFP paper we just presented at Oxford. Okay. And once good. again, this is Michael Ballantyne gets some credit here. Especially Michael Ballantyne invented uh, this beautiful notation. <laughs> <laughs> and so he'll explain that at office hours tomorrow. It's a racket bug. It's a racket bug in uh, the way Quasico is handled, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So we found that one. Um, but the more interesting part, as, so anyway, this, this is a higher order uh, version of. And you can tell that by the last line, right? The last line says, eval expirator m that better be a function because there's a left parenthesis around the whole thing. Well, you and can like tell this, from the lambda line, yeah, right? Yeah, but I'm at the light level for this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, you could see that we have lambda a that represents a closure, mm -hmm. and then the lambda y represents an environment. So we have a higher order representation of environments and closures or procedures, even though Mini Canron only has first order syntactic unification. So one of the things we get gain in expressiveness is by writing a scheme interpreter or racket interpreter, we can then build another scheme or racket interpreter on top of the other one. And now we go from first order things to higher order things. So we should be able to do things like higher order abstract syntax and all sorts of fun games that we wouldn't have if we couldn't you know, synthesize lambda. And actually, we can put logic variables inside of this code and synthesize parts of the higher order interpreter. It's very slow because we have interpreters inside of interpreters inside of interpreters. One of the things we want to do is try to collapse those towers of interpreters to speed things up. So that would give okay, us just, a tremendous amount of expressive power if we could do that. I think seeing this shows that the kinds of things we're thinking about have tremendous potential. So I think that's a good place to stop. And thank you for your attention. Is that code up anywhere? Yeah, this code, this code and some of the examples you saw are from the ICFP 2017 paper. And Which is that free. paper um, has the code online, and there's and Nada Min created uh, an online version of of the paper where you can run all the code without having to download anything. Everything's already set up, so you could, uh, yeah. If you if you just look for for the ICFP Perl, you'll see it. So now we have a short break until 11, so uh, you can go back downstairs, there should be coffee, tea, there should be some all day long, so if you know, you're ever feeling like a refill, it's going to be uh, downstairs. So let's reconvene here at 11 for the next session, and if I could have the speakers uh, from the next session uh, come here to you know, make sure their computer works uh, with the setup and all that, that would be fantastic. All right, thank you very much, and see you in 20 minutes. Hi, Dave. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. I just wanted to let you know that the, the Little Schemer was probably the most influential book I read in programming. Thank you. Thank you. It, uh, it really changed my programming style for 20 years, and it's what got me into functional and lisp and racket. Thank you very much. But, you know, that was preceded in 1974. Say that again? That was preceded in 1974 in a book called The Little Lisper that I wrote. 
the yes. green. I'm sorry, the little lisper. Yes, the little lisper was the one I meant. So oh, uh, okay. I the little schemer. I'm so disappointed that actually the name had changed and the alliteration is gone. I, like, I know it's, it was a shame, uh -huh. but um, it really was scheme at that point. Yeah. And when I wrote the little lisper, it was ink, <laughs> just ink. Right. It just didn't even have that syntax. Oh, I just wanted to let you know what it is. Oh, I would hope so. Mr. Zakian. What are you talking about? I just want to know. Oh, really? Oh, it Not to cry, but to hide. To hide. <laughs> so, no, I, uh, I think it's more. I think it's more. It's too much. It's like basically on the Yeah. Oh, no, I was like, no. It's a grocery store with a Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, store. Yes. 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 It, it is one time, but that's very well. Right. 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 That's all I can say. Right. 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 If I'm going to do sound, goddamn, we don't want to do sound. I'm not ready. Uh, uh, so, so I think if you have yeah. a it's funny we both ended up in computer science too. Wouldn't have called that. No, uh, I think he's headed to Facebook after. Oh, he's going to do, he's going to do graduate math, yeah. Yeah. Amazing as always. You just show up in all the right places. Of course. That was great. That was really great. Yeah, he's not a
Mostly. Well, the, 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 the way Matthias put it to me um, is he, he had a possible um, uh, from it's a place in New York, the company in New York. Uh, where they do all kinds of things. And, 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 and the problem is the interview there, and it's like he's technically brilliant, socially. Uh, yeah. We've got to work on this. It's a technical part. He's got that. Uh, we've got to get his communication. I mean, he can get the papers published in office, but if you send him an email, um, the way I describe his unique email, he might be able to send it. He's going to get a response. We've got to have a different way to do it. He loves this stuff. He already knows that he wants to do it. He has a lot of your name when I was trying to, I think I didn't end up citing you, I don't remember why, but, you know, we tried to come up with, with, with citations, because I was trying to look, because it was, you know, F expressions were completely Mitch tossed Lons off to the side. Not that long ago. Yes. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, the one that's still on the list of all the journal. But it might not be, but I'm sure if you go to Mitch Warren's web page, you can find yeah. the paper on that's yeah. 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 the I used to call them text Yeah, Yeah, but if you, if you walk up to somebody and you say text they may or may not know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. Well, I called it call by text because that gives you a... I think it's, it's done that as well. Yeah. That's funny. I, that's, that's, I found somebody's PhD dissertation 10 years ago also that on um, compiling, compiling uh -huh. text groups. Wait, is this and, a French guy? Uh, no. You some, should look at his paper by... Yeah, I should. St. James. St. James. Saint Jean. Saint Jean. <laughs> uh, now the only thing is what is this first name? Um, well, that's, that's probably good. Enough. You will find it. Mm -hmm. that, that you should find it before you leave. Okay. Otherwise, you send me. All right, yeah. But um, well, my my way of thinking is go kill Saint Jean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So but, Jack. <laughs> um, uh, I was on his dissertation committee, uh -huh. and it is so clever. Oh, it's cute clever, yeah. not deep clever. Basically, he said, um, if I treat a fly as a fly, ability to find values on the stack. That is, I, yeah, okay. Okay. Right, that's, that's like kind of a cute category theory. Well, I don't know. APPLY. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you yeah. Function in yeah, 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 yeah. Then you pass more arguments, so you're yeah. pushing on the stack. And um, I'm pretty sure you can, 
figure out the rest from that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a way to tap it. Okay. Right, yep. Okay. So it's a little more rest argument thing, but you could be using racket to figure out the Very clever. I can't, I can't believe I can't believe it. Yeah. Anyway, so you I should look this up. It's head. all in French, though, but okay. that's no problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, Translate it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, if it's interesting, I, I actually run well. Very, very interesting. Right? It's, he does. He does he it's but it's all interpreted, right? Compiled. No. It's compiled. It's all compiled. But the, the F expression applications are compiled? Like no, no, in there, line there's the, no F expression. Okay. Oh, all oh, right, all right. It's it's not in, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, I, I so, all right, so this I've so missed. Um, it, well, what, what blew my mind was if you, if you, if you, Thomas Murray. Okay. Yeah. What blew my mind is if you get rid of everything dynamic, then as long as the program is static, you can compile it. Right? You don't need to write macros. You can write the interpreter for the macro. You know all about you can projections? Mm. Okay. This, this is not a... You ought to know. Yeah. This is you must know. Okay. Oh, hold on. Let me go. That was going to be said also, but we didn't get to that point in the discussion. Sorry. So do I know about what now? Fudomura. F U T U. Fudomura. Projections. A projections. This is uh, just this so much. Three more projections. Uh -huh. But there's only three projections. Okay. And you only have to learn three of them. Okay. Nice. And they're easy. Because you saw them all today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically. When we wrote that interpreter, yeah. the last one with a higher order and everything, that would be, I think, the third three to more projection. But you need to find out. It's absolutely not acceptable to, to not appreciate what they do. Hmm. They are also the, they are the way to think about partial evaluation. That's, yeah, because okay. this, this is all, the, the nasty thing was my, my little compiler was, you know, I had a bunch of heuristics and hacks, yeah. and my partial evaluator was a bunch of weird hacks. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the so that would be a good gotta, basis you for got that. To know about okay. Not, it's not an option. Nice. Yeah. All right. If, if there's any one thing you need to do, is go to Google. Yeah. Take okay, care. Cool. Thank you. As long as you can, and so you get some vague notion of what this is all about, mm -hmm. and then start trying to emulate what you're seeing, mm -hmm. right? Like the compiler compilers, compiler projections, uh, and you'll see. Um, and then start looking for papers that people publish them and refer to them. But it's not an option. Yeah, I haven't seen a reference to that in like towers of interpreter papers or anything like maybe I missed it. I didn't no, know, no, no, no. But we, I we suspect, didn't know yeah. Either. Okay. <laughs> Alright, yeah, so when does that I don't know. So just go to the yeah. Well, right, right, right. Go to go to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I think do more projections. There'll be references to those. And, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not an option. You must. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you. I got a note from one of my graduate students, Jason Hume. And he said he sent me a note. It was just before I took off. Mm -hmm. He said I just read this quote. Mm -hmm. and, the quote. He said, and if you do this, using the third Fillmore projection, uh -huh. you automatically get coins. <laughs> I didn't know that. Will didn't know that. Nobody knew it. <laughs> but in fact, that's why it's really un under girls, everything mm -hmm. that we can have. This is where and Will, of course, is getting a little ahead of me now because he doesn't have five grandchildren and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little things like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, my wife I'm, says, okay, just, this day is taken for grandchildren. Oh, no, no. 
Okay. Cool. I, I just have a six month old son, so that's the, yeah. everything just slowed the hell down. It, it is just, it's like, it's kind of like the roof. You're walking along and you're doing just fine. Yep. Awesome. It's no matter how good your intentions are, do not do well. That is, honestly, this is the big reason I left the U.S. was I did get with societies, and I, I wanted a society where you go home, you go home. Oh, so France is home. You're back to France? Yeah, I'm, I'm, so, you know, I live in France. That's okay. the, I, I'm visiting my family here, oh. like my, my parents, I, I live over there. Oh. I left the U.S. exactly because... Did this be Paris? Yep, Paris. And, just, just yes. Yeah, I know. I, I, work, I actually work in, in yeah, exactly. I work in uh, microelectronics to make cat tools, and I'm trying to I'm trying to find people with cats. <laughs> Sometimes my humor is about like it or not. <laughs> and yeah, man, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to like pick the brains of the, of the cock folks for all these geometric transformations. Well, you, you want to prove this guy, right? So, anyway, all of this is I was going to say that is, that is impressive the, that you just like having fun with new stuff. Still, mm -hmm. not the kind you get when you get but the kind you get when you get when you get when you get yeah. I'm, I'm waiting impatiently for this one. <laughs> I don't know, I can't, I can't, I cannot get into acting on the It's hard to get like, cock, you can, okay, it's not, for the, for the, for, the, for what I'm doing, it's fine if things eventually turn out, right? That's like, I would like the chips to be manufacturable. So, but, so cock, I can, I, I can start to work in like, all right, how do you do ge geometrical transforms in it? Like don't, actually doing the real program. Like, yeah. Yeah. What, do you know what time he's... Oh shit, I gotta miss it. I gotta go to... I gotta leave it. All right. But maybe I will... Thank you. 
So we're going to get started again. Uh, so before we begin with the talks, just a couple of more quick announcements. So first of all, you may have seen the shirts on the table downstairs. Those are not just for show. Those are for you. So <laughs> there, there's a lot of them in there still. So, I mean, I think they look kind of good. And they look even better if you look at them with the glasses. Hint, hint. So please do take one and, uh, you know, show your racket pride when you get back to the office, to school, or to wherever. Spread a good word. All right, so uh, now I will introduce our first speaker of the next session. So I'm pleased to introduce Darren, who's going to be talking to us about going from prototype to production at Pion. So thank you very much, Darren. Okay, can we, is this working? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, my name is Darren. I'm an engineering manager at Pion. We're a small company. So that means actually I do way more than the title implies. And uh, I, want, I use Racket all the time at work, but I wanted to talk about a specific instance where we developed an instrument. Now, when you work for a small company driven for profit and you want to sell an instrument, it means you have no time. Because the sales guys have already located customers, so everything is pedal to the metal. And I wanted to point out how much Racket really helped. So first, a little bit about me as far as a programming background goes largely self-taught. I've used uh, quite a few programming languages, especially we used uh, Zilog multi, uh, uh, microcontrollers. So some assembly in C there when we design our own boards. But when the project starts getting larger, the time it takes to develop very low level hardware and the code associated with it really does go up quite a bit. So when I had a short time to develop a, long instrument, a large instrument, the first thing is get as high level as fast as possible. The faster I can get to racket, the faster I'm done, basically. The way I look at it there. So what does our company do? <laughs> what does our company do? Our company uh, develops instrumentations for pharmaceutical companies to do drug research. That means you take a pill. What happens? Okay? We want to answer how much of a drug is dissolved. You took a pill, say uh, it's a 100 milligram pill, only half of it ever dissolves. Of that half, only another half maybe is ionized, which means uh, it's only the neutral species that can cross the membrane. And of the half of the half that is unionized, it takes time to, trans, uh, to go from your intestines into your bloodstream. So you may still lose even more of it yet. So our instruments, by and large, answer these questions. And here is the one, one of them in particular. Now, I apologize, this is not a glamour shot. I simply took a big old piece of white cardboard and put it behind our lab instrument. <laughs> so this is in practice, literally, what it looks like here. And we have a, a large dispensing body and a, sort of a measurement head and then an auto sampler to select multiple samples. Oops. And here's the dispensing. We have a strong acid, a strong base, a salty water, and possibly some kind of co-solvent like uh, methanol is very common. The measurement head here contains a pH electrode, very important. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on the digestive system slide, but the pH throughout your intestinal tract, your whole digestive system changes. So it's definitely important to keep track of pH. Uh, we do do UV analysis, so there's a fiber optic probe here and a stirrer to keep everything moving and a temperature probe for temperature control. And then there's just an auto sampler here. Now it, is, it has about uh, 16 positions here, but only eight of them are used for measurement. The rest are for washes and buffer calibrations and so on and so forth. So again, my goal was, as I stated early on, I didn't have a lot of time. I needed to get as high level as fast as possible. So that means getting some kind of Linux ready CPU. And here I have uh, the single board computer that I found. What was very helpful about this, first of all, it can boot directly into BusyBox, 
But otherwise, you can go into uh, Debian for, um, for development. That's a lot easier because you have full access to terminals and so on and so forth. But the key feature of this is it has, it's actually on the other side of the board, but it has an FPGA on it, which means that a lot of the hardware communication that needs to be a little more low level can be taken care of right away in the FPGA. So you has, have to spend even less time trying to write DLLs, for example, which then you use the foreign function interface and try and lift into Racket for. So a lot of this can be done right on the FPGA. Very helpful, really boosted development time. So you, you get the trade-off of time for money. This is more expensive than if we had designed something custom for ourselves, but it would have taken time that we didn't have. So this is the choices you have to make. So the boot sequence is roughly that the BusyBox OS loads. This only takes less than three seconds. And during that time, it loads the FPGA, soft loads the FPGA with whatever custom code you have. And then it launches Racket. <clears throat> but that takes, uh, so then the Racket does the last configuration, but as you know, Racket startup time is a little slow. So the total time is about 20 seconds from power on. So the Racket takes about, yeah, about 15 to 17 seconds to get up and running, which is a little bit unfortunate, but that's what we have. So how does the main program run to control all these devices? It's fairly straightforward. We have the PC sends something to the main loop, which parses it and looks it up the devices that the command is intended for in some device table, which may send it either to real devices if they're connected or software debug devices if that's the mode we're operating in. Those devices then send a response back to the main loop, which then sends it back to the host PC Windows PC, for example, that's controlling it. That's the full thing. It's not very complicated. Here's an example of a command that we have. So the PC would say something like, uh, hey, tell me all the devices that are connected. So you powered it on. It discovered a bunch of devices. Which ones do you actually have? And first it acknowledges. Um, zero means, in this case, that's a valid device and a valid command. I understand. No problem. And then later it comes back with a list of all the devices. So we do have automatic device discovery. That helps, of course, uh, if something's going wrong with one of the devices, you'll notice right away because it's not appearing in this list. Another example would be to tell the dispenser to pick up uh, some volume of liquid from a certain port. And again, we get an acknowledge of some sort that says, yes, I know uh, this device exists. This command seems to be formatted properly, et cetera. And then later, sometime later, after the device has done its job, it responds with this thing. Now this whole system has to be asynchronous because all these things take quite a bit of time. So if we're trying to, to precision dispense very small amounts of liquid, these numbers are, this uh, one million would be one milliliter. It's, the units are nanoliters. To precision dispense something, not only does the motor have to turn a very small amount, but you actually have a very, very thin capillary to dispense the liquid. So even dispensing a small amount of liquid, what we would think would be small, you know, like 100 uh, microliters or something, can take quite a bit of time. Otherwise, you have too much back pressure in the system and you blow all the liquids out. So in some sense, none of these are real-time operations, which is what makes it very easy to get into a high-level, quote-unquote, scripting language right away. So that's a rough overview of what we did. And now I just wanted to, to indicate what I found most helpful about Racket versus basically anything else I've ever used to do this kind of work. And um, first thing I, actually before I get to the helpful part, my apologies, I did want to say what was difficult about it. Uh, the difficult part was that Racket doesn't actually offer any sort of solutions over any other language in terms of the main development cycle on an embedded system. If you're not working directly on the system over a terminal, then you're still you have one machine in which you write your code, and then you transfer it, you do some compilation, and then you, then you can test it. Nothing in particular helps with that in Racket, unless you write your own infrastructure behind it for testing. Um, startup time is significant, and if I had to do this over, I might try and write some of the initial PC communication code in C, so that the instrument fakes it, 
it appears that it's ready before it's actually ready so that we could get the startup time of like three to five seconds under normal. And uh, there's still some duplication of efforts. So when we're doing, uh, when we're communicating with other companies' devices, they often just use like byte strings and so on. So when I'm writing my code, I sort of end up duplicating some string functions in Racket to work with bytes instead. Those don't always work directly. So what really helped? Um, yeah, major opinion warning. I love, I love that it's dynamically typed at the core. I don't have anything against typed languages at all. I, I know several of them, and I do use them. But when you go to test a program, the typed portion, uh, using a typed language, creates the entire program dependency, or at least what you're testing, a whole module or whatever. And you may not be testing that. You may only be wanting to test a chunk. So when you hit run, or you type run, or you load the program, you know what you're intending to test, and the type system doesn't. So to me, I, I just, I really like that aspect of a dynamically typed language where you don't inject this whole code dependency every time you hit run. And when you're exploring other people's hardware, it's actually kind of important because though they create documentation for you, chances that that documentation is actually correct, 100% correct, and that doesn't have its own little quirks is very small. So you do end up doing quite a bit of debugging with hardware, and I find that that really helps. So you get, if you start typing everything, you get a sort of death by a thousand cuts scenario because you need the whole program to be correct before you can test this little piece of it and so on and so forth. And I find it very hard to do this speedily. Maybe it's my own fault, but I found it a major strength. Uh, the next strength is like nearly everything is first class in Racket. And that means, means good and bad. I mean, but what it does mean mostly to me is that uh, what first comes to your mind to, to handle some problem is most likely to work correctly. It's, you can throw around classes and functions and so on and so forth. The very first thing that comes to your mind on how you would do this, you don't have to then undo your thoughts to, to match it to whatever language you're writing. Like Racket already has most of these structures available for you. I found that to be extremely helpful. Same, same thing with what I would call plain old data in Racket. Anything where write and read work together. And Racket has a ton of these in terms of, of course, regular cons structures like lists, prefab structures, and so on and so forth. That's super helpful. If you're using these kind of structures, you can save data and read it right back again if you need to. You can print F it or you know, have it, it, things evaluate to that, and you can read it basically by your eye directly, especially in the case of uh, prefab structures. It's very transparent what you're intending to do. Having this available out, the, out, the, out of the gate really makes things very fast, in my opinion. And also, I think custom syntax. Now, I put this hardy quote up here to illustrate my opinion on what some people would call uh, syntactic sugar. I don't really look at half of my syntax is syntactic sugar in the sense that I'm trying to write a procedure, but it can't be a procedure because it can't, the evaluation rules have to be slightly different. And you get to delay a lot of decisions that way with syntax. Now, it may be a quote unquote bad use of syntax, maybe somewhat against some wishes, but I found it to be extremely conceptually simple. And I just want to give a few examples. They're not amazing, um, but my first one would be something like every, dev every device responds most of the time with a standard response. This cannot be a procedure because the standard response of the body doesn't get evaluated. It first needs to propagate this up to the main loop so that the main loop can respond with this acknowledge zero so that the PC says, all right, I know it's working. Then it's allowed to work on the body. I could, of course, simply wrap that up in a thunk, but that's a decision that I ended up making later in the development. Earlier in the development, the body was handled in different ways. So Already most of the code, if it was written in this way, worked. And I only had to change the underlying implementation of the syntax to settle on a model. But that means it reads like it is. And another thing I'd like to point out is 
It also means that uh, not all responses are standard. Some devices don't have standard responses. We have one, for example, repeat the last response. We would get in some kind of crazy loop where you make a repeat last response request, and now your last response was repeat last response, and you don't want that. So there are non-standard ones. So you want to name it already. You want to name it just like you would any other function. But again, it can't be a function. So I did cover that, and same thing with uh, body. I have another one, for example, where I just define the protocol for some of the classes. So most of the um, uh, devices are mapped to racket classes. You want to define an interface for these, and you want to define, say, the bit strings that rep, uh, the byte strings that represent them. You can do that in the same place when you use define syntax, because you can use a begin and then have several defines. So everything becomes very clear when uh, you probably can't see that very well. I'm not sure, but these are all the kinds of commands that everything can respond to, and these are how you would call them as a byte string. So you just get to couple that definition right there instead of having this sort of strung out in some weird way in the code. And it only takes a defined syntax rule of like, what, four lines to, to separate that out. Now, again, this is, this is a syntactic sugar kind of situation. But it's so helpful when you go back six months later to look, to look at something like this. Another thing is the uh, copying pasting is avoided like crazy. Because I'm sort of modeling everything as classes and I have specific kind of public functions I want to declare, basically for a lot of the standard functions I just have this one defined. It, it takes care of the inner structure and everything else of the class and then I just get this declared in one place and it's done. And I don't have to copy and paste, change it one place. But you can't do that with a, with a function. You can only do that with syntax. So I mostly think of syntactic sugar as I'd love this to be a function but. And so that helps a lot. Finally, this, this is actually my last one here. I may have gone over just a touch, I apologize. But this saved my life. If, if, <laughs> if we're debugging Windows, how do we manage this? If we're in Linux, how do we handle this? So we're, you know, most, we're a company, we use Windows mostly, and when I'm running it on my PC, so I did end up creating the infrastructure I discussed earlier. I don't know where else you could do this. I mean, maybe I'm just ignorant and that's my fault, but this was so easy to write in Racket, it was ridiculous. If we're Windows debugging, then some file system exists like uh, dev null, and if we're not, I mean, if we're Linux debugging, then dev null exists and not, and then you get to branch off a few things like some of your command protocols to based, uh, based on whether or not you're in Windows or not. And this is so helpful, it's, it's unbelievable. So it allows true cross-platform development if you've put just a little bit of effort into having this, this conditional branch. So that's it. I want to thank everyone a lot for Racket. It's super helpful, and that was it. Darren, yes. Um, I, I have a question kind of for the larger racket community. This has to do with your startup time. Is there a way to uh, freeze racket in some way so that you can start it up more quickly if you're on a slow, small device? Uh, no, not correctly. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the question was, what were the protocols for dealing with the actual physical devices? And those were extremely varied. I did mostly skip over that slide because I was really tight on time. But we have uh, some basic digital input output. And I did end up writing a DLL for hardware communication for like single bit hardware. And then uh, that got lifted into the FFI. Other ones were a lot of serial communication. So a lot of devices are serial port of some sort. And that was built into the FPGA. So I got to leverage that directly. And the manufacturer of that computer actually maps their FP, I mean, their serial ports to um, TCP IP ports. So all I, didn't, all I had to use was open a port and start sending strings down it. Oh, uh, and 
also, so the stir, for example, needed was a motor control. So that again needed some kind of pulse width modulation to use. So that was also through uh, the foreign, the FFI. So it did not. Um, it, oh, I'm sorry. Did the uh, the question was whether the garbage collector ever got in the way? It did not, and that's because again, none of these none of these devices are real time devices, so to speak. So the time spent garbage collecting, you would never notice anyway, because for example, the dispenser is sitting there taking 30 seconds to make a move, because it's going so slowly. So that enabled us to very easily not worry about garbage collection at all. Thank you, Darren. Uh, so before... So before we move on to the next talk, I've been notified uh, that there was a Google phone that was found at a women's uh, restroom. So if you have lost a Google phone, uh, you may want to uh, go and get it. Uh, so Amanda, who is downstairs, uh, is the one who found that, so presumably she's the one who has it. So uh, if you've lost it, uh, please go see her. All right, so now our next speaker will be Leif Anderson, who will be showing us how you can do movies in Racket. Thank you, Leif. All right, thank you, Vincent. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, okay, cool. So, as Vincent said, I'm gonna talk about movies in Racket. Let me start off by telling you a story. This, this is me from a year ago at last RacketCon, where I was in charge of producing all of the videos. The recordings went relatively well, but at the end, I was in charge of then compiling everything together and uploading it to the internet. So what I had to do is I had to take the presenter's screen, the actual video of the presenter, and the audio of the presenter and audience questions, and somehow mix them together into a you know, production-ready video like this. So. I had a few options for what to do. I could do what I did the year before and open up this. This is a video editor. I could sit down and, you know, a few hours later I'd be done with one video. <laughs> Unfortunately, because this is RacketCon, I had another dozen to do. Now, the thing is, the process of putting these videos together is fairly similar. You put the same tracks in the same places over and over and over again. It'd be great if we had a way to automate this. So what I did is I went and looked at the landscape of existing automation tools. Uh, I could use some plugins for these editors. Uh, unfortunately, most of the uh, good proprietary ones don't have very good plugin infrastructures. And uh, the open source ones seg fault a lot, so that was not good at all. I could use some operating system UI scripting tools, but those, as we know, are extremely brittle and they just break all the time. And so the last option I could do is use a shell scripting language, like something like FFmpeg. Uh, unfortunately, that, while powerful enough, felt a lot like using assembly, so to speak, to write my videos. So. I needed to take a step back and figure out what it is. You see, we had a problem. We wanted to do video editing. But what we really wanted to do was we wanted to solve video editing in the actual natural language that video editing is best solved in. So what works here is making a DSL. Now, Racket is actually a really great tool for doing this. Why? Well, it allows us to split our DSL into two big parts. First, we start off with a library. And this contains a lot of the smarts for it, but it's, it's still just a library. And then we wrap around syntax, as we saw in the previous presentation, to, to turn it into a language. And then finally, you can distribute your whole language as if it were a library, uh, so that they can be composed quite nicely. Let's take a look at 
what makes a video editing library? What we have here is four pieces. Producers, filters, uh, playlists, and multi-tracks. Okay? Uh, producers are the fundamental, like, atomic part of video editing. What a producer is, is anything that cooperates with render, this render function here, to produce some video file. Okay? The most common producer is clip, which takes a path string and returns a producer of that video. So of course, when you compose these two together, you're going to get some video outputted, in this case, embedded right in the slide. Uh, this is this code actually running. Uh, Demo.mp4 is in the same directory as this uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, filters. <laughs> <laughs> allow you to take a producer and munch some data with it and get a different producer. So we can take this scene of a bunny waking up. This was uh, from the Blender Foundation's, uh, uh, one of their open movie projects. And what we can do is we can apply this sort of sepia filter here, if I can get my mouse to the right place. and. There we go. Uh, and we get the exact same film now, but the projector is kind of ruining the colors. <laughs> but it, it look, if you were to look at it on my screen, it looks as if it was made like 70 or 80 years ago. <laughs> so that's great. But filters only work on one producer. So we still need a way to compose these filters or uh, producers together, and that's where playlists come in. Playlists compose our producers temporally, putting one after the other after the other after the other, uh, like we have in this case. Again, this code is being li run live in slideshow, where you have a looping video of a bunny jumping and a squir flying squirrel taking off. Sometimes, though, you don't want to just jump from one clip to the next. Sometimes you might want to say fade from a clip. And so transitions serve as a bridge to connect multiple producers uh, that are being appended together. So we can take the exact same clip, except now we fade to the actual squirrel. And we can see it again when we fade back to the, the bunny. OK, cool. Just like playlists compose producers uh, sequentially or temporally, multi-tracks compose producers um, physically on top of each other. But because you can only really put one on a screen at a time, what you need is to use these merge concepts, uh, such as, say, compositing, to merge these two uh, producers together. Uh, and so in this case, what we've done is we have merged these two videos and played them side by side. OK, so that's, that's the library, OK? But we still have to talk about the language, right? Like, this is where Racket uh, gives us a, a giant win. Uh, the first thing we see in our video language is, again, we see the producers. But what we really, what, where it really starts to be cool is we see list comprehension. Uh, so we can just iterate over uh, just various videos. Uh, and you'll notice we have this call to external video right here. This external video jumps to another file. And you'll notice that we are calling, the, the video file is branded, and the function is branded. So we call out to the branded function, passing in the arguments we gave it. Uh, finally, you'll notice in this define video form right here, while it looks like just several expressions, that is implicitly a playlist um, that is turned into a producer for you. You're probably wondering, how does it know whether or not to use a function, though, uh, or the top level. And you'll notice then 
this is resolved by using video or video lib. When you put all of this together, you get a video like this that starts with the logo and creates this mosaic of four different videos. Cool. So how were we able to do this? If you were looking at the timeline last year, it took me about as long to make this language and then edit all the videos as it did to edit the videos manually the year before. And the year before I had help. This year I didn't. So what Racket lets us do is it uses this, the, pardon me, use this concept of linguistic inheritance. All right, so let's say we have Racket here at the bottom, and on top of that we want to make videos implementation, and then finally want to write some videos with our nice video programming language. So what Racket lets us do is we'll take some features and just pass it on through and make it part of video. We'll also remove some features that we don't want because it makes our video DSL more clunky. We'll add new features, such as the core library I talked about earlier. And here is where Racket finally shines, leaps and bounds among, uh, above so many other languages. It allows you to actually change linguistic constructs. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, when you write hashling racket, or whatever your hashling is, hashling video, hashling dan scheme, hashling really cool embedded system language, right? Uh, the reader will go and put this uh, module begin in there for you. This module begin is language specific. It's what we call an interposition point. And then the expander will go and take this module begin and turn it into what you want uh, your, your DSL to be. And so in this case, it takes all of your expressions, collects them together, puts them in this vid begin, and provides the video. But you'll, you'll, you'll notice again that the, these two module begins are different, one being implemented on top of the other. And so this is handled by this rename out right here. You see, what we did is we did you know, define syntax. We did video module begin, interpreted it in terms of this uh, base module begin, and then renamed it out so it had the same name, but it was a different module begin. This technique actually was so very useful. Not only did we use it for video, we used it eight different times Actually, that's probably a bit of an understatement. We probably used it much more than eight for making video. I'm going to spend a little bit of time, because of the uh, keynote we had, talking about the type system as an example. Now, a, say we take a video clip and we try to take the first 50 seconds of it. But let's, or we take a 50 second video and we try to take the first 100 seconds of the video clip. My apologies. The problem is there's not enough video to take the first 100 seconds, so we would like to allow or disallow that. What we can do is we can come up with a type system uh, of producers such that shorter videos cannot put, be put into context that require a longer video. And we come up with types like this, which you can program right in the code exactly what the type rule would look like. So you don't even need Mini Canron for that. <laughs> yeah, you could use it. Uh, but this was, ac this was written in a language called Turnstile that uh, Stephen implemented in, I haven't updated the slide, but it was in Popple 2017. Um, my apologies. And so that, that is our tower. So where are we going with this in the future? Well, let's say we have our we have a video editor, and what we can do, again, all of this is being done in the slides, is if I can drag my thing, the thing here, this is closer to a traditional video editor, and I would like to be able to edit this manually and do something like, say, click run, and have the video that we just edited play. 
In fact, I think we can go one step further than this. And, and, and what we can really have is we can have our video editor in our code and have that code contain video editors and go all the way down. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we, we actually have some of this, right? We, we have the, the video editors and code bit. But what we can then do is have a DSL that we can use for building these editors so that we can do this with not just video editors, but we could do it with you know, document editors, or we could do it with slideshow. That way, we wouldn't have to keep using Hashling slideshow as an example. Uh, and so that, that is video. Thank you all very much for watching. And uh, I recommend you go try Hashling video, <laughs> either from the website or from your local friendly package server. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes. So I, I appreciated the you can't make a 50 seconds clip into a 100 second clip. But if you have something like a picture overlay that could be extended indefinitely, how is that handled? Yeah, good question. Uh, the type of that is going to be producer of infinite length. The question, the question. Oh, pardon me. The question was some clips are infinite in length, like an image. So the way this is handled is uh, the multi-track form understands that an image or some producers are infinitely length. And so the types there work out. And the multi-track is then responsible for cutting the image to the right length. Does, does that answer your question? Yes. OK, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell. I see there is a hand over there. Ah, good, good question. Uh, the case for this is somewhat like Scribble, where you can use include section. What I want to do is have the video. I want to have the video module be an actual video as interpreted by render. So because they all provide the same name, vid, external video can be used, first of all, in an expression level as if it was a dynamic require. And then second of all, it doesn't need to, uh, it takes care of the, the naming because everything is named vid. D does that make sense? Cool. Uh, yes. That is a great question. Um, uh, pardon me. The question was, the heavy lifting was done with FFmpeg. Was this a performance problem? And also, how? Yes, the heavy lifting was done with FFmpeg. Yes, I did compile it statically to an object. But that object was not runnable by FFmpeg. That object was runnable by the video runtime, which used FFmpeg for transcoding. It turned out that, yeah, Racket is kind of slow. But it turns out encoding video is much slower. <laughs> so no, there was not any performance problems because the bulk of it was, was in the, the encoding bit. And in fact, I ran a few benchmarks. And using video was about as fast as using FFmpeg from the command line, just because encoding is really slow. <laughs> uh, any other questions? If you have any, I can't see your hands, so just. It does not have a progress bar. Ah, yes. Okay. It does. It's ugly. It's terrible. I would love it if you helped me make it better. But yes, we do have one. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
There's feedback, and you can operate it like you could in a REPL, even. Um, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Ah, okay. Good question. Uh, the question was, <laughs> you know, for once I was doing that, but thank you. <laughs> All right, no, no, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, the question was, how do I handle aspect ratios? Uh, and the answer is, every video clip has a property set that takes its height and width. And so, what you as a programmer can do is optionally uh, change the aspect ratio to be what it is you want. Uh, the actual squashing and merging uh, is handled by FFmpeg, uh, but you could either scale it down or up without changing the aspect ratio, or just change the dimensions. The, the choice is up to you as the programmer. All right, any other questions? Again, hands, uh, or if you have, one just yell, or we'll, we'll, uh, we're done. Okay. Cool, thank you. Uh, lunch is coming right after after Jack's talk. So uh, speaking of Jack, uh, I am pleased to introduce our next speaker. Uh, who uh, can you put your slides up? Uh, yes, I. Okay, fantastic. Well, anyway, so our first our next speaker is going to be Jack Firth, who is going to be tell, talking to us about his opinions on testing and improvements that we can do uh, for testing in Racket. So, thank you, Jack. Testing, testing, there we go. <laughs> uh, I, I promise I didn't plan that. I wouldn't deliberately torture you. Uh, so this talk is about a toolkit of RackUnit packages that I made. And RackUnit is Racket's standing testing frame, uh, framework. And I wrote too many packages, so I'm going to have to go pretty fast. <laughs> I really love RackUnit. Um, I use it all the time when I'm writing Racket code, and it always it, it's just very, very easy and simple to use, and it's just a very seamless tool. But it doesn't handle complex stuff as well as I would like. So I wrote too much code. <laughs> I made a bunch of packages that handle a couple of different independent kinds of tests that I wanted to be easier to write. Uh, and you don't have to use any of them together. They're all independent. Um, but considering just a, this is like a run-of-the-mill factorial function that you know, anyone might write. And we have a module. We provide it. We implement it. And we want to be sure it's correct. So we write some tests. And we can do that with RackUnit by just adding a test submodule, importing RackUnit, and then writing some checks that say, pass this input, get this output. We are done. <laughs> That is all you need to do to get started with a test. And the racco test command line will take your file, run the tests, and tell us that we screwed up. <laughs> because as it turns out, it was giving the, uh, the factorial of 4, it was giving us the factorial of 3. So the failure output is generated by RackUnit, and it includes the actual and expected and the name of the test, as well as source location information. And that's possible because rack unit checks are actually macros that will grab reflective information about where they're called and include it in the test output. Oh, and Dr. Racket runs these tests for you, too, and shows them right in the window. So we go back to our tests, and we fix the bug. And there we go. We're done. <laughs> and be, uh, it might seem weird to have the test in the same file but Racket has submodules, which means that although they're in the same file, there are two separately loaded modules. And the dependencies of one are not the dependencies of the other. They're independent. So a client can import just the code or just the tests. And you don't have to force all clients of your module to have a dependency on your testing framework. So this is awesome. <laughs> this is everything I want. It's really easy to write new tests. I can just go into any random file on any project I know, know nothing about and go and just write some checks. I don't have to figure out their directory structure. I don't have to figure out the commands and tools they use to run tests because it's all pretty standard for Racket. And Dr. Racket will just do it automatically when I press run. And it's really great for collaboration and doing things quickly and seamlessly. 
but <laughs> there are some limits here. Uh, Rack unit gives you a couple of basic checks out of the box, but they don't do much more than simple comparison tests. Like, are these things equal? Does this one satisfy some predicates? Or does this thing match a pattern or a regex or stuff like that? You don't get much in a higher level. You can't really write check. It doesn't give you a lot of checks for things like, will this, uh, will this string parse as a language with a syntax error or not? So how would you test things like, does this function log to standard out? Does it log messages? How do I test network calls and mutation and all sorts of fun stuff? Because I really wanted to test those things. So you, a rack unit gives you a define check macro for writing custom checks. And you won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> because checks are, in rack unit's model, just functions that either do nothing or they'll throw an exception that contains some random key values for failure information. Um, this means that if uh, you call another check, uh, it, will generate fail, um, it will generate information based on where it was called in your function, not where your outer check was called. And that's good for some bits of information and bad for others, and it's not really always clear how to combine them. And furthermore, just using exceptions for control flow in general is a real pain to abstract over. Like they're not, it's uh, hard to kind of make sure that you're doing things in a right evaluation order, and, and it's just, it's not fun. <laughs> so that's the problems with custom checks. And they do not work if you want a custom check form that is not a function. If you want a custom check form that behaves like a macro, there is no API for that. You have to go into Rakuten's internals and figure out how they do it and copy paste code, which is what this check match form from Rakunit is actually implemented as. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> That's, that is not fun at all, and I don't like writing that. So there's another aspect of Rakunit that has some interesting consequences. It has test cases and suites that you can use to control how checks are evaluated. So I can group a bunch of expressions, and if one of them fails with a test failure, the rest of them don't get run. Pretty simple. Um, however, this simplicity is kind of hard to, it, it has some things about it that will surprise you. Uh, you might have already seen this one coming. If a check fails, you don't get automatic cleanup action because it's not, you aren't expressing that there's a resource you want to clean up to the test, you're just writing expressions. Uh, even stranger, if you nest test cases, and a nested case fails, it swallows the exception, and later checks in the outer case keep going. <laughs> yeah, I had a real fun time finding that one out. <laughs> so I just said, screw it, I'm going to write some testing libraries because I had stuff to do, and I didn't want to waste time trying to replace RackUnit now that it's in the main distribution and all code on the, all Racket code on the planet uses it. <laughs> so. Here are some libraries I made. First, I made a library for writing test mocks. And you can install this as racko package install mocks. And a mock is a function that will spy on however it's called and keep a list of every way it's been called. So you can make a mock and give it some behavior function that says how the mock should respond to calls. And then you call it, and it acts just like the behavior function. But later, you can use mock calls and get a list of everything it's been called with. And there's a little argument structure that just represents a bundle of arguments. I made another little package for that, too. So if you ever find yourself wanting that, there you go. <laughs> um, included in the mock package is a way to automatically replace functions with mock implementations for tests. Here, we just have a little function that prints a friendly message trying to communicate with humans. Um, and testing the output is something that we wanted to kind of do simply and easily. So we mock out display line. And we say that uh, in the mock behavior, it should be called void and do nothing at all. So if you call it normally, it does the exact normal thing you'd expect. But if you introduce a with mocks use, it will pull off static information from the friendly AI identifier and bind all of the internal implementation stuff to mocks 
bring them into scope, and now when you call friendly AI, it only goes to the mocks, and you can inspect those, the calls made to those mocks for testing. <laughs> I like to think of mocks as the ditto Pokemon of testing, because really when you're using a mock, you're saying, I want to test how I'm calling this thing, not what it's doing. So it's really great if you don't have a good way to test what something is doing. Like you're working with some external API or some library that wasn't really designed with testing in mind, or something that requires you set up some sort of expensive resource, or something that like you need AWS keys to do. So it's really great as a substitute for the real thing. So that was the first problem I tried to solve. The next one is I wanted to deal with integration testing. So I made a package called Disposable, and this was a way for me to abstract over creating and destroying stuff, especially stuff that involves IO and ex to external resources and other systems, like a row in a database. So a disposable value is a pair of a way to create something and destroy something. So here, if we have a way to create a universe and destroy a universe, we can join them together into a disposable universe. And with this, we can go and make a bunch of universes in a whole bunch of different ways. We can say, just for this set of expressions, make a universe and at the end, or if there's an exception, destroy it. Or we can say, give me, this, uh, you give me a universe until this event fires. So here we use it for a timeout. Or you can say, just give me a universe and clean it up right before the program ends. We can also compose disposables and they compose as monads. So, if you happen to have a way to make a disposable galaxy in a universe, and you have a disposable universe, you can chain them together, and now you just have a way to automatically make a disposable galaxy in its own isolated universe. Voila. Just monoids in the category of endofunctors. <laughs> <laughs> now, because disposables offer an abstract API that's very uh, that it gives you a lot of options, you can also make an automatic pool of disposable values. If you've ever seen connection pooling, it's where, since connections to things can often be expensive, if you're going to create and destroy one, instead you return it to a pool and reuse it in the future. We can do that with any disposable. So here, we're making a pool of disposable universes. Say there should only ever be 10 in the pool at most, because we don't want to keep all 10 universes in one computer's memory. Not really sure how well that would do. <laughs> And we don't want to keep more than three around for new customers. So we can take this pool disposable, and this is a disposable that will give you a pool. So we acquire the pool globally, and then this pool is itself a disposable that you can use to get a value from the pool. So here, we have a global pool that will be cleaned up at the program exit and destroy all the universes, and we have a way to lease values from the pool with disposables. So this might not seem like it's related to racking it directly, but that's where my third package comes in. <laughs> Fixture. Here, we're going to hook together disposables and rack units and do some cool stuff. So if you have some disposable, you can define a fixture for it. And then in a rack unit test case, you can declare fixtures that you need for your test. And in that test, you automatically get a current whatever that's used and created for your test specifically. And if your test fails or errors or whatever, um, it will be cleaned up at the test exit. Now, on its own, this isn't really much better than just wrapping it with disposable, but fixtures will do it once for each test in a set of nested tests. So instead of having to manually declare that each test here uses the f user fixture, I just wrap them all in a super test and then declare it once, and the boilerplate is gone. So now, there will be four users created here. One for the outer test, and then one for each of the inner tests. And disposables also integrate with Rack Unit's check info system. So you can say how a disposable should print and show in a test failure. So if we have a way to, from a user, give you a nice string representing who that user is, instead of some weird opaque struct or something, we can attach that to the fixture. And now when this check true false thing fails, we will get the list of all fixtures in the actual failure output. 
So this is collected automatically for all fixtures in the test case chain, not just the ones in the closest one. So fixtures on their own imply you're making one of these things for every single test case, which can be expensive. So you combine them with disposable pools. And now you can appear to make a giant pile of resources for every single test that's isolated and not used by anybody else. But they're reused between tests, giving you faster tests that don't have to do a whole bunch of database I.O. Voila. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> so I went and did all that and had a great time. But along the way, I just kept thinking, this is really a pain. <laughs> because I have to make rack unit checks and integrate with rackets, notion of dynamic parameterization of how tests are executed, and all this very imperative indirect stuff. And I found it very, very frustrating. So I got one more package. <laughs> Expectations. An expectation is a pure functional representation of an assertion. And the idea is that in rack unit, the central problem is that the checks don't really give you much information to other checks. It's very hard to cross communicate and do useful things but across multiple checks. It's hard to compose over them and abstract things. Um, but what if we split responsibilities and we have the check just be responsible for the sort of integration with the testing framework, sort of Macquarie stuff where we capture location, all that sort of thing. And then we have this expectation responsible for all the logic of whether our test passes or fails. So here we have this expect equal value. And this will create an expectation. And here you can apply an expectation to any input. And it gives you a list of faults. And expectations are just pure functions that do plain pure functional things. So this, not really easy to read, but when you use it in check expect, it renders like this. And here we see the original subject that the whole expectation was applied to, that list. We see what it expected and what it got, but we see that in a context. It is nested in the piece of the list for you automatically so that you don't have to see a big giant diff of two huge data structures. It will narrow down the specific parts that are wrong. And this works even if there's multiple different failures, it will give you multiple different things it expected in different contexts. So let's take a closer look at what those faults are. Um, a fault has a summary, it's just a little string describing it, and it has an expected and actual attributes. Instead of just plain values, they are attributes that are some abstract representation of some property of the input. And the reason you want to do this is because you can't always test things by saying you were looking for a certain value. You might have been looking for a set that has this in its, this as a member. Or, so, or you might want to say, I was looking for some value that matches this predicate. So those sorts of notions become different attributes. And a fault also has this list of contexts. And contexts are, again, structured data that represent where in the fault you are. And the reason it's all structured instead of strings is because that way, expectations can use other expectations' faults and abstract over them and do things with them. So here, let's look at this case where we have an expectation that says, I want a hash that has a foo key mapped to any set that is a subset of this thing. So it's not just a simple equality test anymore. And this is where it gets much easier to use than, I, I don't know how I would write this test with a rack unit that would that would be quite an adventure. <laughs> so here, we can look at the failure output and see that the actual set it found was 132, and it expected that 3 would not be in it, because that wasn't in the subset originally. And it tells us that it was in the context of the hash key value. So because expectations use these heavily structured representations of errors, we can combine them in very fine-grained and abstract ways. For instance, we can take a list of expectations and combine them into one that applies them all and returns all the faults they found together. Or we can say, I want to take a function, pair it with some arguments, then take that thunk and assert that it raises something. Or I want to say, I'm going to take a syntax object, make a thunk that represents macro expanding it, 
and assert that that macro expansion returns something. Or, and there are other things you can combine too, like you can compare identifiers pretty easily. Um, now, that's what I have now, but what I want is I want this to go nuclear in terms of interesting expectations. For instance, you should be able to say, I want to check for all values generated by this thing that all of them satisfy this expectation. And now I have a way to do property testing and other sorts of like soft verification things. Or I want to say, I expect a function where when I give it these inputs, it runs in quadratic time, or it runs faster than this other implementation of the same function. Or I want to abstract over other sorts of things, like I want to say, for, all the, for the set of all transitive dependencies in a package, I want to expect every one of them has a license so that I don't get in some hot water. <laughs> and there are all sorts of things like this you can write, and I say you because I want you all to write them, not me. That's too much work. <laughs> and I really want expectations to be something that you can build this sort of stuff on pretty easily and extend and make new fancy libraries and you won't have to touch custom imperative racking at checks nearly as much. And that's all I got. <laughs> so. I guess we do have a little time for questions. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, um, it seems like really the benefits of disposables is that you have pools and they can be composed in nice ways, but the actual process of acquiring and destroying resources seems like Racket's custodians already kind of handle that situation. Mm -hmm. So is there a particular reason that you created a separate API for acquiring and getting and destroying disposables rather than just attaching them to custodians? Very good question. It was, why did I make disposables when Racket has a notion of management of resources through custodians? And the reason for this is that uh, disposables are a very different use case than custodians. Custodians are for resources that are external to Racket, but Racket kind of owns interacting with them, like memory allocated man uh, manually or other sort of runtime internal stuff because when a custodian shuts down, the shutdown code run by the custodian is run unsafely in atomic mode doing all sorts of evil gross things. So it only works if you have things that you know you will always be able to clean up. Disposables are for things where you're talking to external systems like a database or an HTTP API or God knows what. And uh, you do not want to do that in atomic mode unsafely. <laughs> uh, so, this is, a, this is for very much just external resources that you kind of have to treat like things in a distributed system. For instance, although disposables give you an API where you won't forget to destroy things, you can't guarantee you'll be able to clean something up in a database because the network could go down. Who knows what could happen? Uh, so actually, when you do a global acquiring of a disposable, this is why it uses Racket's plumber API, not custodians because Racket's plumbers are for this sort of soft cleanup of things that you can kind of abandon and won't have, require unsafe actions. There, I have a couple GitHub bugs open where I've written, oh, okay. The question is, <laughs> some of the stuff expectation does is very similar to some of the stuff contracts do, and some of the stuff closure spec does. The thing contracts do that expectations can't is contracts can do higher order checks where they have a boundary and blame and all that sort of stuff, but the flat data checks that expectations can kind of do and closure spec does, uh, those are very related. And, um, I do have some ideas of how to take an expectation and turn it into a flat contract and maybe sort of reuse some of contracts error messaging uh, logic to kind of make pretty contract error messages. Uh, but it's just sort of hypothetical stuff I have notes of on GitHub, not like fleshed out. <laughs> so expectations are 
simulations look very nice for writing tests, but often if you're writing a lot of tests, you would want to not write as much code as uh, you showed. Is there, uh, have you thought about providing a sort of magic, do what I mean, uh, expectation API that just figures out the right way to compare everything uh, even when you have embedded yeah, that's there. Uh, it's uh, under expectation conversion in the docs. But the gist of it is that anywhere the library expects an expectation, like the check expect check, you can just pass in a data structure and it will convert that uh, using the equivalent expectations. And if there's nested expectations inside the data structure, it will use them. So you can say, I'm going to just pass a list of five things and four of them are data and the fifth one says, I want this thing to be even. And that will just magically work. Let's check. Uh, so now, yeah. <laughs> so now is the time for lunch. Uh, so lunch will be downstairs where registration and breakfast were. And so uh, we have two hours. So let's reconvene here uh, at, at for uh, the next talk at two. All right. Enjoy lunch. Yes. Uh, yes, in fact, they would. So uh, please, the next speakers, uh, the speakers in the next session, uh, if you could please uh, show up 10 minutes early and uh, check in with John, who's going to be helping you during the session. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>